Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to Strategic Command, World War II in Europe. Uh, this game is a new game out by Fury Software, published by Matrix and Slytherin Games, and I've been playing it a bit. I think this is part five or six of my Let's Play. All the previous versions, for the most part, uh, with one exception, had been live stream discussions, so the audio all came from the live stream. This is something a little bit different. Now, my intention with this series is to get into historical discussions about events in World War II and kind of progress through the war uh, as history happened and discussing those events. Now, the one thing with doing that is I think it makes more sense to do that after the fall of France. I think that will be easier to kind of pick as a starting point, seeing as we didn't start with the invasion of Poland. And um, in my last video, I talked about some interesting tidbits of history, but not so much uh, what was going on on the screen at the time. I will probably repeat that in this episode, given that France has not yet fallen. Uh, we have driven through and are about to conquer uh, Holland. Uh, the capital is ours. It's just a matter of hitting the turn button before they'll surrender. Uh, we have also already conquered Belgium, and we are starting our drive on Paris. Meanwhile, Italy's launching a minor invasion into southern France, but the bulk of our forces have been directed to North Africa, uh, understanding that really, unless our intent is to completely conquer France, including her colonies, there's not really any point to invest substantial Italian resources on an invasion of France. Uh, because if you do want to, you can basically at the end of France, when France falls, you have the option of either setting up a Vichy government, which will manage the remaining French colonies, or you can say we're going to go ahead and invade the rest of the French colonies and conquer them directly by ourselves. The problem with that is then you have to conquer French territories in North Africa, which Italy and ourselves are not anywhere near set up to do. So given that fact, uh, we are probably going to accept Vichy France, which means there's no real point in wasting Italian resources in southern France because those will all end up being expelled once the Vichy government is set up. Now, as you can see here, we are driving on Paris. We've got some tanks just a few turns away, and I expect the French to pull some troops back, use their rail lines, and put some troops between us and Paris. Uh, that will probably happen this turn. Uh, we've got an infantry column and a tank column streaming forward. And the topic I wanted to talk about in this video uh, is, and you saw that I think, I think that Holland just surrendered. What I wanted to talk about in this video is, I'm reading uh, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William Shire, who was an American, I believe, in Germany during at least the early years of the Nazi Reich and the early years of World War II. Uh, he was a journalist. And it's interesting how he's talking about some... Oh, by the way, the uh, Iraqis have, uh, I believe... Well, they haven't rebelled. I don't think... I don't know. I guess Kuwait was just taken from Iraq. Um, but the... The interesting he, he brings some interesting perspectives to World War II, and this is quite a volume of voluminous book, or vol, however you pronounce that, um, about Germany and kind of more the political side necessarily than the battlefield side. But I thought it was interesting because I'm kind of going through the same period of time right now in the book as we are in the game. Uh, we're just before the invasion of France. We're looking at the invasion of Norway. He's been talking about the German-Russian alliance, or at least the, the friendship there. And there were some things that I really didn't notice or didn't know, and I think they kind of are interesting to call out. Uh, for one, you know, Poland fell in, what was it, October of 1939, and Hitler apparently <laughs> had put together orders for the Germans to attack the French uh, as early as November of 1939. So he essentially wanted to transit the entire army and a month later invade France, and his, his officers were aghast at this idea. But the interesting thing about that was... I can't imagine it was very easy for the Germans to plan or, or develop contingencies around that because they were given orders for November. They protested, but he maintained those orders. And then every time once it came within a few days of the actual operation going off, he'd postpone it for maybe a week or so, usually using the excuse of weather or some other event that would cause him to postpone the attack. And this happened 14 times. So it's really interesting if you're thinking about the general staff trying to plan and uh, provision their soldiers. Apparently the Germans only had enough ammunition for about a third of their divisions to be in combat for only a period of two weeks, which is insane if you think about it. I mean, that would have put the ammunition crisis in World War I to shame, uh, the fact that the Germans were so poorly equipped. Imagine if the French had attacked at that time and serious fighting had, had broken out, what would the Germans be shooting back with after a few days? Now, the flip side of that is I don't know how well equipped France was for a protracted war, and this was another kind of surprising piece during that time period is 
The French general in command was so unwilling to attack, despite the fact that his allies, the Polish, were being attacked in September, uh, that he told his, his French government that the French army would not be ready for any serious offensive actions for two years after the outbreak of war. That's insane. If you think about how quickly France was able to wage effective war in World War I and launching massive, you know, attacks and what have you. And obviously that no one was ready in World War I for the sheer expenditure of ammunition. Uh, and they certainly had issues with ammunition crises. But he was basically saying the army was two years away from being ready to launch offensive operations. Now, surely some of that is a little bit of fear or angst about the fact that World War I was such a bloody frontal attack. They probably wanted, they were kind of probably pulling a McClellan, if you will, a, a uh, George B. McClellan from the American Civil War, where they were basically saying, we will be perfectly ready with an overwhelming uh, amount of equipment and manpower in two years, uh, kind of how McClellan would be in front of Richmond, you know, with 40,000 more men than the Confederates, and he would say that, well, actually, the Confederates have way more men than we do, uh, and I need more men and more supplies and all of that, you know, same sort of deal, talking themselves out of attacking. Which is funny, too, because when you think about it, when when uh, Poland was fighting the, the Germans, the Germans only had like 20 divisions in the Western Front, and the French had more than double that that they could have attacked with, with the German army completely uh, unable to respond because they were physically located elsewhere, although they were behind these defensive entrenchments, which, again, you kind of have this World War I syndrome where no one's willing to launch a frontal attack against heavily fortified positions because of the horrible experiences that they saw in World War I. Again, sort of a, a misunderstanding of how warfare had changed between the wars. Though you can see here that Paris has been taken. We've taken Paris, so France will fall the next turn, and we will have to make that decision on whether we want to assign a Vichy government, uh, which will again give the southern portion of France independence, as well as the French colonies, in a pro-access government or whether we want to conquer all of France. And spoiler alert, I'm going to go ahead and accept Vichy France. I'm also going to immediately start reinforcing our troops uh, using all the time we have. We're a little bit late in conquering France uh, by over a month, so I'm going to go ahead and use this uh, time to uh, reinforce our troops because we're about to get a massive windfall of money from our plunder of France, and I want to make sure that we're able to use that money effectively to get all our troops back up to full strength. Um, but anyway, as I was saying, it's, it, it was interesting to me how unprepared or how, how, how unwilling the French were to attack or go to war. The Germans even tried to negotiate peace after the fall of Poland, and yet, you know, the Western Allies kind of dismissed this. They basically said, no, we're not going to go for peace unless you actually pull out of Poland. Uh, the Germans actually thought they had a chance. They thought there was a realistic opportunity for a negotiated peace after the invasion and conquest of Poland. Um, the first British casualty, I think it was said, uh, of the war didn't actually happen until, was it November, I believe it was? Like November 9th, I think it was, when you consider the war started on September 3rd. That's crazy. You know, it really gives credence to this idea of there being a phony war in the Western theater. But then again, Hitler wanted to launch offensives against the French in November, just a month after the conquest of Poland, even though his forces weren't anywhere near ready. Uh, and it kept getting postponed and postponed and postponed into January. And then another extraordinary event happened in January where, you know, for those of you who, who know, and obviously we invaded in this game through Belgium, but Hitler actually had his war plans captured by the French, or the Belgians, sorry, by the Belgians, in, you know, early 1940. I think it was in January of 1940, a German major uh, carrying the war plans that detailed the invasion routes and the plans, everything except the date of the invasion uh, of France and Belgium and, and the Netherlands. Uh, his plane uh, got lost in the fog and had to make an emergency landing over Belgium, and it was this almost... Again, I'm going to bring up George B. McClellan in the American Civil War because I've been playing a ton of Ultimate General Civil War lately. But it was almost a Antietam-type event where, you know, at the Battle of Antietam in the American Civil War, Robert E. Lee had his entire army's disposition and his plans uh, written out as some orders. And one of his generals carelessly wrapped those orders around cigars, failed to destroy it, left it at a camp. And then the American, you know, the Union Army came up and some troops were bivouacking in the same area as where this Confederate general had been. They stumbled across three cigars wrapped together with these orders and they were able to discern Lee's entire invasion plan. It was almost like that, you know. Uh, the German major, his plane goes down in Belgium. Uh, Belgian soldiers are coming up to him to kind of try and, you know, like, what the heck are you doing here? You know, we're neutral, we're not at war or anything. 
And um, and here's our decision, again, to uh, either go with Vichy France or go with uh, a Complete Conquest. We're going to go with Vichy France. So you'll see me kind of highlight over the notes and everything like that, but the decision will be to go with Vichy France. So this major is being approached by these Belgian soldiers, and he has to make the decision to you know go ahead and try and destroy these orders because obviously he's got some of the most classified and important documents uh, that exist in the entire German military. And he first he tries to kind of start a little campfire and, and, and kind of burn them, and the, the fire actually ca- catches the attention of the Belgian soldiers who hadn't really seen him yet. Um, and then they kind of grab the grab the documents and, and kind of start looking through them. And then he grabs them out of his hand and tries to throw it into a into a um, kind of a fire that was was going. I guess wherever he was being taken, there was kind of like a, a, a outdoor sort of furnace or, or what have you but then they you know they they grab him out of there and, and and put the fire out again and he reports back to germany that hey you know i destroyed these orders don't worry about it the only thing they got left was some ashes but that wasn't the case the the, the belgians began to mobilize their forces uh and they passed the invasion plans onto the french and to the british and the germans weren't entirely certain what the what the allies had but apparently it was quite quite substantial uh, and as a result, you know, the invasion was finally put off in January indefinitely, uh, and the Germans completely rewrote their invasion plan for the most part. It was, you know, materially different by the time the actual invasion of the Low Countries came in the spring of 1940. One, one wonders if the Germans had attacked in November or in January and any of these poor months with, with bad rain and winter and what have you, if the invasion of the Low Countries would have been successful um, and, and one wonders, I, I don't know off the top of my head how the invasion plan was different, uh, than, than what happened in reality. So it's, it's really kind of a fascinating bit of history that, that doesn't get talked about quite a lot when it comes to World War II. And you can see all of these, uh, it, or French colonies are declaring their loyalty to Vichy France. Uh, I believe it's interesting actually that, um, a lot of the North African colonies of France declared loyalty to Vichy, but the kind of Central African and the Congo and these areas declared their, lo- declared their loyalty uh, to the Free French, who continued their fight against the Germans. And one must wonder if that's because they were further removed from you know Germany, and Germany had no real feasible way to get at the Congo or, or these other you know, French colonies, uh, but uh, that's kind of, if you, I was looking at some maps of Vichy France versus Free France at the initial partition, and it was pretty interesting to see certain parts of the French Empire resist. You had other parts of, like, French Indochina, which I don't think they declared their loyalty to Vichy, but I'm not really sure, but then the Japanese attacked them anyway, uh, you know, uh, in, in their conquest of Southeast Asia and inflicted serious losses on the French there. So it's it's an interesting little bit of history. I really don't know a lot about Vichy France. But again, so you have this whole history around these orders being captured, the plans being changed, the constant delays, and then you have the Germans getting involved in Denmark and uh, Norway, uh, where the Germans were getting large amounts of resources from Sweden. They were also getting resources from Norway, important ore imports that were critical for their economy to be able to function. And taking Norway would basically allow them to secure their supply routes, not only from Norway, but also shield the supply routes from Sweden uh, off from any potential allied interdiction of those supply routes. Um, not going to go into detail about Norway, uh, but what I think is interesting is often when you hear about Germany uh, in World War II, when you hear about their economy, the, the big difference, and one of the big differences between World War I and World War II is that in World War I, the British blockade successfully strangled Germany. It didn't cut all their industry off or their flow of you know resources, but Germany was crippled by the British blockade, it, so much so that their people ended up starving by the end of the war. Their soldiers were malnourished, and, and one of the key pieces, as you can see, Iraq uh, revolts against the British and ends up uh, joining the Axis side, you can see there's a garrison in Baghdad, and I believe that cuts off the flow of oil from uh, Baghdad, and you can see the Japanese just launched their offensive against Indochina. Um, but the the interesting thing is if you look at World War I, the British were able to effectively blockade Germany into economic stagnation and destruction, and in many ways a large amount of the German uh, failures in World War One were economic in nature. The German economy was strangled. Um, and by the way, we're going to go ahead and support the rebels in Iraq. It's a small amount of money, and it'll help them uh, resist British attacks. 
But as I was saying, uh, sorry if there was a yawn there, it's a bit late tonight. Uh, but as I was saying, the economy in World War One by the, the Germans was crippled by the British blockade. In World War II, that wasn't nearly the case. Now, some of that was because Germany was able to overrun France. They were able to overrun Poland, Eastern Europe. So they had a much larger economic base to draw from in terms of crops and other things like that. But even as, as early in the war, in September of 1939... Exports became, or imports, became critical for Germany to be able to feed its people, be able to feed its industry. It needed these ore imports from Sweden and Norway. Those were absolutely critical to the Germans being able to continue their war effort. But it also needed oil from Russia, which I think is well documented that Germany bought oil from Russia. What I feel like is less well known is that Germany also relied on Russia to be its breadbasket. And Russia was providing cereals and other key resources to the German economy. What I feel like is rarely discussed is that 1939-1940, Germany was selling state-of-the-art weaponry to the Russian military. The Russians had the Germans over a barrel, and they knew it. Stalin himself was actually involved in trade negotiations with the Germans. And again, the Russians knew that they had the Germans over a barrel. So if you think about how absurd it is that Germany was in the midst of a shooting war with France and Britain, although they weren't really shooting much at them. And in that time period, Germany needs these resources from Russia so badly that they actually end up selling the Russians 30-plus modern fighter aircraft, modern Messerschmitt 109s. They end up selling the Russians modern artillery shells, modern artillery pieces, providing them sort of samples of modern experimental German weaponry. They end up selling Russians key industrial and military-grade uh, manufacturing equipment so that Russia could you know, retool its industry and get itself up to speed. They essentially allow the Russians to subsidize their industrial development and their industrial development within the military-industrial complex. They're selling the Russians military equipment and the ability and the, the tools needed to build military equipment which is crazy when you think about the fact that uh, only a year later, the Germans would be invading and attacking these very people, and that wasn't a surprise. That was in Hitler's game plan. Hitler was planning to invade Russia from the start. Uh, so he was so desperate to keep the Russians in a positive frame of mind because he knew he couldn't afford to fight a two-front war at this early stage when France still exists. He was terrified of the prospect of a two-front war, very much so, uh, as a result of the experience that Germany had in World War I. But he was willing to strengthen his eventual enemy in order to appease them. And it was not even, I mean, these, this was not a uh, small, small deal to do. I mean, it's it's crazy when you think about it. Imagine the United States selling Iraq uh, M1 Abrams tanks, you know, in January of 1990 and then invading in 1991. I mean, I know the U.S. did sell weaponry to Iraq uh, in the 80s, but none of it was ever, you know, state-of-the-art American weaponry. None of it was ever, uh, you know, America wasn't selling them smart bombs or stealth aircraft or anything like that. Um and, uh, you know, if you look at the Iraqi army, the vast majority of it was Russian. It was more financial assistance that the Americans were giving them. But it was still, you know, that's probably a poor example. It's still kind of a crazy thing. Like, I guess a, a better example <laughs> might be uh, America selling North Korea weaponry or North Korea selling, a, you know, South Korea weaponry right before the invasion of South Korea in 1950. Um, again, just all uh, really out there kind of things. And, and by the way, in the game here, you can see uh, I am attacking British aircraft carriers in the channel, uh, winning devastating victories here. Uh, I put down one British carrier, and I'm about to, I hope, put down a second British aircraft carrier so that uh, the, Royal, the Royal Navy will have suffered a crippling blow, or at least that's my goal, is to uh, put a crippling blow on their ability to wage uh, air war against uh, against us at sea, which should be useful because I'm kind of thinking, you know, long term, I'm hoping to get my navy out into the North Atlantic and into the Atlantic Ocean to help disrupt British convoys. And um, if I can destroy their carriers, then obviously that will be uh, much more feasible. You can see here they're 
Second carrier was just finished off by our battleship or battle cruiser, the Gneisenau, or sorry, Scharnhorst, and I was able to pull it back into port where it gets serious defensive bonuses from any enemy attack. So just like that, the Royal Navy loses two aircraft carriers and the entire balance of power in the North Atlantic shifts. That doesn't mean that we have anywhere near equal footing in terms of naval firepower. We don't. But at least in terms of naval aviation, the British have just lost serious, serious uh, capabilities. It will also dramatically aid our submarine war in the North Atlantic as well. Historically, the British lost several carriers to submarines. I think the Glorious was one of them. Uh, but uh, the ability to do this in game should be very beneficial, I hope. But anyway, I guess that's kind of just my other interesting point was that uh, the, the fact that this all occurred, it's just there's a lot of diplomatic dealings on that go, go along. And this is kind of in, in, in line with my theme of my last video was that I just don't think the diplomatic machinations of World War II are often all that explored or understood. It seems to me that the reputation of World War II is that the Germans attacked Poland and everything flowed from there. They had a friendship with Russia limit for a short period of time, and then Germany turned their back on Russia and invaded Russia. But I don't think you know some of these other events that went on, like the seizure of the German war plans by the Belgians and the sharing of them with the Allies, who didn't do much with them, uh, and then the you know the German dealings with the Russians, where Stalin himself is acting as a trade negotiator uh, in in dealings with the Germans to get crippling uh, benefits from from the Germans in order to you know benefit from their trade, is is all that well discussed or understood. I mean, the Germans discussed selling the plans for the German battleship Bismarck to the Russians in exchange for Russian goods. They uh, looked at selling the Lutzow, the, the actual warship, the Lutzow, uh, to the Russians as well. I think that was uh, one of the pocket battleships. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and contradict myself. I was just looking that up, and uh, it was actually an Admiral Hippier class uh, heavy cruiser named Lutzow that was incomplete. Uh, that was renamed, you know, the pocket battleship Deutschland was renamed Lutzow, and the Lutzow class heavy cruiser, or the hippier class heavy cruiser named Lutzow, was then sold to the Soviets. So the Soviets actually purchased an unfinished heavy cruiser, which was never finished. They purchased rights to 15 inch naval guns, uh, and, uh, you know, all, all of this going on uh, with the knowing anticipation by the Germans to go ahead and invade. Uh, the Soviet Union, you know, sometime within the next year to year and a half. That was always within the plan. Uh, so just, to me, that's mind-boggling. I mean, I, I guess, you know, maybe maybe it's not that crazy, but imagine, you know, imagine any major nation planning a war and then selling some of the very best technology and equipment to their adversary right before the outbreak of war. It's just, it's madness. Um, anyway, guys, uh, those are kind of the interesting things I had to talk about. Uh, one, one other aside, when I was doing that little bit of digging, uh, the Deutschland, or the Lutzow, was actually bombed uh, by uh, Russian SB-2 bombers in the Spanish uh, Civil War. I didn't know this, but the Russians actually bombed uh, some of the forces helping Franco's troops. And uh, while the German cruisers that were in in operations there were not actually participating in combat or anything like that, they were bombed, and 32 German uh, sailors were killed or wounded uh, when the pocket battleship uh, Deutschland, later renamed Lutzow, was actually hit by Soviet bombs. Just a random tidbit of history. This episode's kind of been a little bit all over the place, so I apologize for that. Uh, now that France has fall, fallen and Vichy has... Uh, been, you know, liberated, or not liberated, but uh, been set up. My plans for the following videos are going to be, you know, looking at the historical events as they occur. So as we kind of go through 1941, or late 1940 and er into early 1941, some events will occur, you know, uh, potentially will invade Greece, maybe Yugoslavia, uh, will also obviously fight in North Africa with the Italians, and then later on probably the Germans, I imagine, will send the Africa Corps. So there's a lot of sort of anticipated events that will go on that I think will be much easier to build a, narr a narrative around, uh, and that's where I'll kind of go from there. Um, I'm not sure exactly the timing of this. I'm still working on some Ultimate General Civil War stuff. Still want to do some historical lectures around the Civil War. Uh, I'm approaching on 10,000 subscribers, and that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm only about 150 away, so that's probably about two weeks away. Uh, but all in all, you know, so far this year, it's been a great start to the year for the channel. Uh, it's been an enjoyable time playing Strategic Command. It is one of my favorite games thus far. 
uh, and recently, um, I don't usually get into kind of these grand World War II games that aren't ultra micro like the Gary Grigsby games, but in this case I have. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the plan going forward, is building some historical narrations around events like the North African campaign, uh, the invasion in the Balkans, the eventual invasion of the Soviet Union, which I imagine I will bungle, and then I'm sure my eventual defeat at the hands of the Allies, as I don't think I'm a very competent player at this yet, but it is a lot of fun. So I hope you guys are enjoying the series thus far. Uh, I would appreciate you leaving any comments or thoughts. I kind of tried to mix in some discussion about what was going on in the game in this episode, as well as uh, some you know historical discussion. This was much more hist- history-focused. So let me know your thoughts below. I know a lot of you guys tend to prefer gameplay. Other reviews prefer uh, history. So I'm trying to mix things a little bit, although there was not nearly as much gameplay as I'm sure some of you would like. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. And I'm out.